Hey everyone, a big welcome back to Season 7, Episode 2 of the Nick Elston Show, the imaginatively titled Nick Elston Show, not a creative guy. Um, however, today I've got an amazing episode to bring you. Uh, as always, I promised you fantastic guests, and today is absolutely no exception to that. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for Mark Pugh! Woo! How are you, mate? <laughs> good, mate, you? Yeah, good, thank you. I'm all good. Good stuff. So for those who haven't heard of you, tell us all about Mark Pugh, who you are, where you're from, what you do, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, uh, my name's Mark Pugh and uh, former professional footballer. Um, got given my first pair of football boots at four years old. and All I ever wanted to do was be a professional footballer. Um, my mum and dad loved it. And I just played grassroots up until the age of 14 and enjoyed my football, loved running around with my mates. Um, at 14, got spotted by Burnley, and at 16, they signed me on my first scholarship. Uh, I spent two or three years with Burnley, and it was <laughs> it developed me because we had to clean boots, they had to be up early, put the nets up for the first team lads. And unfortunately, at 18, I got released, told it wasn't good enough. It was my boyhood club. Um, I supported them as a young boy. All I ever wanted to do was play for them. So mm. it was gut-wrenching. Um, but looking back, it really did develop me as a character, as a person. And on the back of that, I played a lot of football. With, uh, I signed for Bury Football Club and played 43 games at the age of 19. Um, on the back of that, I signed a contract with Shrewsbury for two years. Two years into that contract, I got released again. Uh, told it wasn't good enough, so another setback. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I had to deal with a lot of setbacks from a young age and got told it wasn't good enough. And it's heartbreaking, to be honest, as a footballer, especially when you want to do it, you know, as your job and and, and you aspire to be great. And I always dreamt to play in the Premier League. Um, the following season, after leaving Shrewsbury, I signed for Hereford. That season, I scored 14 goals. And three of those goals were against Bournemouth. And a certain Eddie Howe took a shine into me. And he signed me. I spent nine incredible years with Bournemouth. Mm. Uh, two promotions, League One to the Championship, Championship to the Premier League. And that was where I wanted to be. Um, I visualised it. I set goals that, that I wanted to test myself against the best players in the world. And I can say I spent four years in the Premier League. And that's just like a small part of my life. I don't want to uh, blabber on too much about it. But yeah, um, and now um, going on to, to a new chapter in my life. Absolutely, which we'll definitely come on to. And that's kind of how our paths kind of crossed. Um, so we were both on the lineup at Accountex 2023 in London. Uh, actually had the pleasure of meeting briefly in person between our <laughs> engagements as well, which is really cool. Um, but I mean, that's kind of be something we're going to come on to as we go through. It's interesting. You mentioned your career there uh, as a, a Bristol Rovers fan that I remember you having a couple of amazing games against us. So I didn't like you for a little while. Um, I really admired you as a footballer, but I didn't like. But then again, if I had a grudge against everybody that had a decent game against Bristol Rovers, I would hate a lot of people to be fair. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we we've got um the kind of quite a lot of Burnley connections at the moment with kind of Joey Barton in charge and, and that kind of stuff. So it's an interesting journey, and thank you for sharing that. But I guess the whole ethos of the show, and then the reason that I love to bring people on like yourself that are uh, famous and well known and high visible, highly visible for a certain thing, is actually to give us the story behind the brand in that sense. Uh, the, the human experience, I guess. So you very kindly shared from when you kind of started forms at, at Burnley. Tell us about growing up. So so what was life like for you growing up, education, family life, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so um, my mum and dad worked really hard, uh, working class, um, and they, they wanted to give me everything I, I needed, like, and they travelled here, there and everywhere, training three, four times a week, um, on a Saturday, Sunday, they were watching games and uh, standing out in the cold and stuff. So I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, and I just worked hard. I th one of my favourite quotes in life is hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Mm -hmm. And all I've ever done from a young age is work hard. Um, in school, <laughs> to be honest, I wish I'd have worked harder. I used to just stare out the window at the football field and just want to go play football. And... Now, especially life after football, I realise there's a lot more to life. And 
Um, yeah, football it is it was everything to me, but it doesn't define you. You've got to have other things outside of your passion. Um, you, well, my obsession really. Mm. Um, I'm now obsessed with nutrition as well. I still love my footy. Um, but yeah, growing up, I was a really driven um, character. I worked hard. And I just enjoyed life. I enjoyed the process. I think I enjoy failure, because, mm-hmm. if that makes sense, because I think the more you fail, the more you grow and develop as an individual. So uh, there's been a lot of failures throughout my career, throughout my life, but I think that makes you a stronger character, more resilient. And, yeah, I think, you know, football will always be a part of me, but mm-hmm. we've got to keep evolving, keep developing as as characters and I learned that from a young age. I I was big on, without really knowing it, when I was probably 15, 16 years old, I did a lot of visualisation. And, you know, visualising me scoring that goal, the way it would feel in front of the fans, playing in big stadiums. And I think visualisation for anyone, whether it's business, whether it's being an athlete, is a really powerful tool. Absolutely. And did that come naturally to you? Or was that something that was taught to you by your parents or by a mentor or by coaches or was it just something you naturally did you visualized what you wanted to achieve yeah I think I, it became really natural from a young age but I got better with it the more I practiced it so I'm really big on vision boards as well so yeah. you know I, I like to I'm I'm not one of these extravagant people that you know gets big canvases and, and get I you know I go online I I look at my vision boards and I for example, when I was 25 years old, um, wanted to get promoted to the Premier League. I was in the championship at the time. I created a vision board. So I went on Google, printed some pictures off that were relevant to me, what I wanted to aspire to, what, what I wanted to achieve. So the car I wanted, the holiday I wanted, the Premier League badge, mm-hmm. um, you know, things that I could, you know, maybe paint pictures in my mind with. So if if I was looking at these pictures every day, obviously you've got to work hard. That's a given. You've got to really push towards those goals. Yeah. I pinned it on the back of my mirror, actually. So I printed these pictures off. So I knew in the morning and in the evening when I was brushing my teeth, I would be looking at them pictures, uh, the Premier League badge, the, you know, the car, the holidays, um, family experiences, whatever was relevant to me and you know, it really did work. It helped with that visualization because I'm a firm believer that you can create your reality, create your reality with your mindset. Yeah. And um, they become more clear. So mm-hmm. obviously you've got to put the work in to achieve these goals. They're not just going to come <laughs> to you. Um, but I think Modernize it's... Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So no, it, I, again, I've, I've worked on it. it. It was quite natural early on. I didn't... Yeah particularly understand it i knew it was a thing but now um i'm a big believer in it so for those who are not familiar with the concept vision boards are a visual aid to support your kind of goals and aspirations is that right yeah yeah and something that so if you're a businessman you know if you're interested in money or success whatever it may be you can put a check on there you know push towards that goal of mm. what you want to earn um and and yeah they're just good representations of where you can get to if, if you really push yourself. Because you see the amount of entrepreneurs that came from nothing. Mm. Um, they really did because it was so driven for success for the family, for themselves. And they just wanted to create a better life. So it might not work for everyone, but it was a great tool for me and still is to this day. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's an interesting one because kind of given your kind of um... – age and the career time that you spent playing professional football you've overseen quite a big kind of shift in tactics philosophies mindset techniques all these things that you're discussing now actually that's very much ahead of the curve wasn't it compared to what's spoken about more nowadays wasn't spoken about when you first started your career no it wasn't I mean there's was no nutrition there was you know the odd um psychology coach had come in mm-hmm. um but Sometimes when you're a bit younger, you probably think, oh, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. But now it's becoming more and more important because, you know, your nutrition, your mindset, the way you feel on a day-to-day basis is massive. You know, whether you're an athlete, a businessman, you want to feel good. And, 
you want to feel like you're going into your job role and you're productive, you've got that mental clarity, and you're ticking as many boxes as possible because I always say improve the small percentages and they will add up to big results. It really is mm. what you do, the small things on a day-to-day basis, whether it's your routine, or am I going to bed and get up at the same time? Am I getting me exercising in the morning, whether it's running, walking, cycling, swimming, whatever you're interested in, mm. do what you feel like you're going to get the most out of your day. Absolutely. And you mentioned you played many, many games at a very young age. So actually before the days of things like development squads and everything else, it was, it's an interesting one. How did you start to manage? And it's something, I guess, working in the in the mental health space myself, that is something that I find really fascinating. How did you manage as a young professional and even further into your career, going out into a place, especially away from home, where a lot of people didn't like you, and a lot of people were going to be really on your back about different things. How did you manage that kind of pressure yourself? Was it something that you thrived on or something you had to kind of become resilient to or both? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love pressure environments because mm. in training, I, I could have a nightmare. I could be absolutely shocking, couldn't do a thing right. Don't get me wrong, I'd work hard. But when I'm out on that field, I can't think back to many instances where I had an absolute nightmare because I was in front of a crowd. I think when you put yourself in that pressure, maybe the fear of failure, I, I hated failing. It's a good thing if you do fail because, it, it, you know, you can develop. But I do like the pressure environment. And I think letting someone down, um, someone telling you you're not good enough, like when when the manager at Burnley at the time, the first team manager when I got released at 18 years old, told me I wasn't good enough. It was literally gut wrenching. Um, thought my dream was over. I went for a period of like three days. I think it was three or four days where I felt a little bit numb. Um, and to this day, it still sends singles up my spine, thinking I might not have made it as a professional footballer. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was really tough, and that made me a stronger character. Maybe made me a bit more resilient, a bit more focused, a bit more driven. And it's character building because mm. in football, in life, it's a roller coaster. You're gonna have ups, you're gonna have downs. Um, a, a big part of me is like never get too high with the highs, too low with the lows. I think. Um, when, you, when you're young, if you do have to suffer a setback, it does make you better long-term. And in front of a crowd, in front of a difficult situation, I learned to deal with that a lot better. I mean, when I... So going back to my very days, I played 43 games. They offered me a new contract. But Shrewsbury at the time were interested in me and they were going into a new stadium, had big ambitions. They offered me a three-year contract. And I rejected my contract with Bury, and the manager kind of hung me, hung me out to dry in the press. So got got out of training, got back to my car, and I'd got scratches all over my car. Um, um, my wife was working in Bury at the time. She got her old abuse at. Um, I was called a money grabber, this and that. But it wasn't the case. You know, as a footballer, in any job role, you get offered a little bit more money, um, you know, a better company at the time, Shrewsbury New Stadium. Um, the manager had high ambitions, he was signing players. You're gonna go for that, you know, new stadium and and an opportunity. So it was never about the money, it was trying to um, you know, make the best career move possible for me. And yeah, uh, things like that they do make you stronger for sure. Yeah, I bet. I, I guess we had um, a couple of seasons ago. We had Tom Gorin, who's the CEO of Bristol Rovers, on, on the on the podcast, and he was talking about the business of working through an emotionally led industry. In that sense, that I guess, like you said, if you actually put the perspective of Joe Bloggs working on the factory line gets offered more money to go and work elsewhere, they're going to do it. But actually, they don't set the same standards for you because it's their club and it's their connection. It's it's an interesting one that kind of. Tom was saying he has to, to to navigate the the business, the commercials, and the emotional connection side of things. And very recently, just last week, uh, Bristol Rovers signed Chris Martin um, on a short-term deal. And 
Chris played for Bristol City for a couple of seasons. And he actually said in the press, I know it's not going to be a popular thing to say, but essentially that actually as much as I liked being at Bristol City at the time, and I felt I had a good connection with the fans, that this is an opportunity to go and earn some more money for, for another season or so. So it's an interesting one when you're working through an emotionally charged business, isn't it? It certainly is, yeah. I played with Chris at Hull as well, uh, Chris <laughs> Martin, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, I mean, you just do what you feel is right at the time. Um, yeah. You want to tick as many boxes. You you, you want to play football. Yeah, you want to earn some good money because football is a short career and mm. it doesn't last forever. And you just do what's best for your family as well. You've got your family to think of, you know, my wife and kids. When we moved to Bournemouth, that was a massive you know, in between everything, I moved her away from home to Shrewsbury and then we moved to Bournemouth further south because we're we're based up north. So it was a good six hours from home. So you've got a lot of things to think about in football. And you're really fortunate um, if you stay with a club for four years, let alone nine. I was with Bournemouth for nine years. Usually it's every two or three years you may be traipsing here, there and everywhere. So... There's a lot to think about. It's not just about, oh, he's going for the money, he's going for this and going for that. It might be family circumstances. Um, things might have gone on within the club that a lot of fans don't get to hear about. You know, there might have been a falling out with someone, manager, staff, whatever it may be. So there are a lot of variables. And the problem is in, in football as well, if the club want a player to leave, it doesn't really come out as a big you know, article in the press, but if the no. player just leave the club, it's like, oh, the player's a money crapper. So it's, <laughs> it's crazy. You just, you, yeah, that's fascinating. You, you mentioned kind of family life. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of travel involved. You have, you're working through other people's social time in that sense, kind of weekends and evenings and that kind of stuff as well, as well as the training. How has it been to, to kind of juggle family life and your professional life over the years? Yeah, so I've been really fortunate. I, I've got a wonderful wife. I met my wife at 15 years old in school. Um, I've been with her for 21 years now. So oh, congratulations. We, yeah. <laughs> so so she helped me a lot from especially the age of 16 to 21, especially when these outside influences from your friends going out, this and that. I was never one of them. I stayed in, I lived my life right. Um, I wanted to be successful. Um, it was everything to me because what's the point in going out and having a drink when that could effectively ruin your chances of making as a professional footballer? Because mm -hmm. uh, back then, back in the day, um, a lot of people were going out a lot more than they are today. Yeah, uh, they'd celebrate with ten pints after a game. Some, so, you know, twenty years ago. So it's changed a lot now. The game, but she made a massive difference, um, and I probably wouldn't have been the success. I was throughout my career without her because she chose to move to Shrewsbury with me, which was two and a half hours away from home. She helped me with my meals. She was she was absolutely brilliant. Um, we moved to Bournemouth, which was six hours away from home. And to cut a really long story short, she got a job set up. She was, she, she was going to work in a bank and on the journey down, um, she says, I don't feel too well. So I was like, all right, okay. Anyway, she, she ended up taking a pregnancy test and she fell pregnant. Uh, it was a huge surprise, lovely surprise. Um, but at the time, we're thinking, oh, my gosh, we're moving so far away from home. 23 years old. She was 22. Uh, what are we going to do here? Um, because we, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of money saved up. Um, it was a big punt to move to Bournemouth. They were in League One at the time. And it needed to be a success. Um, but she she was an absolute warrior throughout, to be honest. I remember her giving birth, and then she gave birth, I think it was 1 o'clock in the morning, might have been a little bit later, actually, and then at 7 o'clock the same morning, I had to travel to Carlisle to play a game, which was light years away from Bournemouth, so she had to deal with everything on her own whilst I was playing football, whereas I could switch off from things out on the field, kicking, kicking a ball, but she was the one who was mentally bulletproof um, and she, you know, held the family together and let me crack on with, you know, achieving my dream because she did all the night feeds. I slept in the spare room because I needed to recover optimally. So looking back, you feel like you're really selfish, but in order to perform optimally on the football field, 
these are the things you have to do. And I owe her a lot, to be honest. And without a, a proper partner who really wants you to be successful, I don't think that comes. Absolutely. Amazing. I love that. Thank you. Um... What you get out of it is the unexpected. I guarantee you will find something out about yourself. I got up and stood and said something, and I would never have done that before. Find Your Voice Live is our flagship event where we cross the boundaries of personal development, mental health, transformation, and public speaking. I just find it a really, really good, safe place to stand up and talk. It's so great at firing people up, but in a way that's on our own terms and what works for you. So I've been invited to a lot of stage talks, a lot of exhibitions, and I felt like I needed to sort of improve on the way um, I sort of portray myself and come across during these talks. One of the, the biggest things I, I think is um, the use of storytelling but also um, how we can um, influence people through taking them through a journey of different emotions. And give my own presentation style, my own speaking style, a little bit of all. It gives you so much more confidence, it shows you that you know, there is nothing to be worried about, it's just, yeah. If someone was really on the fence about this, I would just say, what have you actually got to lose? It's all about getting out of your comfort zone and this will do it in a very organic and enriched way. Definitely come to this event. <laughs> yeah, just come. Just commit to it, just go for it. Um, well worth the three hour journey for that. You mentioned some of your lows. What would you say kind of ranks up there as your highest highs in the in your career? There's a couple of special moments that I really remember. Um, so getting promoted um, to the championship. So we played Bolton at home um, that evening. We beat them three 0 I think it was it's a blur now. Was it three or four nil? <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, I scored the first goal and the atmosphere was electric. Um, celebrations were amazing. And we knew because we're on such a good run, as soon as we got that first goal, there was no other result really. So scored the goal, did the famous knee slide, jumped in with the fans. Um, <laughs> that was a really special moment, knowing that we'd been promoted to the Premier League. Uh, we hadn't won the league at the time. We needed to win our last game, but this was a Tuesday night. Mm. Uh, but we got promoted and we all went out and celebrated and it was a really late night. Um, but then Thursday, we knew we had to be on it because we wanted to win the league. Charlton away and we ended up hammering on 3-0. Um, mm. we, we, and then the, the celebrations were incredible after Premier League football. That's what we wanted. So that was amazing. But getting to the Premier League was, looking back, the easy part. But yeah. staying in the Premier League for a club like Bournemouth, really tough ask um, and we did that for four seasons I, I absolutely love that but my first Premier League goal against West Ham um, so we ended up playing Aston Villa first season in the Premier League played Aston Villa played them off the park battered them lost 1-0 um, because that's a Premier League they got one chance scored it I think it was Rudy Gisted at the time oh yeah yep. so, so yeah he ended up popping up with an header I mean, I think our second game was against Liverpool. We got absolutely smashed, 4-0 four, four if I remember rightly. And then West Ham was our third game at Upton Park, the old Upton Park. Yeah. And it was a thriller. We won 4-3. I ended up scoring my first goal. And, uh, yeah, that that is that was a real special day. The atmosphere, I don't know whether you've uh, ever been to Upton Park. But I did, back in the day, yeah. But that was one of the best atmospheres I played in. The fans were right on top of you. And yeah, that was a special moment. So there's probably too many to name. Um, so there's a and few. A great things. example. Thank you. I, so you you were known as a, a kind of a, a creative player, an attacking midfielder or winger sometimes. You, who did you look up to kind of through your career? What were you, Who were your kind of role models, I guess? Yeah, so I had two. Um, 
I was well I was a Burnley fan growing up, but I loved watching United. Um, and Ryan Giggs and Eric Cantona were, were my idols. Ryan Giggs was a, a winger similar to me with a lot more pace. <laughs> um, he was a lot quicker than me, but I just loved the way he played. He played without fear. Um, it just glided on the pitch, pace, direct, mm. and I just loved watching him. It, it created excitement, and and Cantona was just Cantona. He was cool, he was cool, cool as a cucumber until he dropped it to fan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but no, I looked up to them. I mean, Ryan Giggs just obviously there's been a lot in the press since, mm. um, but with his career, uh, he did all his yoga, he, he did his mobility. He ticked all the boxes when it came to his recovery side of things. So, um, hence why he had such longevity with his career. I think he played till he was like 39, didn't he, at the top level, went into central midfielder. Um, so, yeah, he he got me, he sort of got me into football and, and the buzz around it, really. Yeah, love that. And you played fairly, up until fairly recently, on a, on a professional basis, I believe, till. Just before COVID, maybe is that right? <laughs> so yeah, th- that was an interesting one. Um, so I was with QPR, um, and I played twenty five games with QPR. I needed yeah. twenty six for a new contract, and I was due to start on the Saturday when COVID hit on the Friday mm. um, for my twenty sixth game. Anyway, COVID came. We had a short break. I think it was about two or three months where we had to stay fit did all the exercise away from the club. And then we went back for a mini pre-season, did all the mini pre-season, I got run to death to get fit. Anyway, two days before we were to start the the season back up, I think there was about nine games left. The gaffer pulled me and said, the club um, don't want to play for that game because we can't afford to keep you on the same contract you're on now. So that was really hard to take, to be honest. There's no fans in the stadium. So, so I understood the situation, but mm. for it to happen to me, I was thinking, why is this happening? Do you know what I mean? And it took me, you know, a few days again, like the Burnley situation, to maybe, you know, process it. Um, and I just, I'm a big, big believer in God. I pray a lot, and I believe everything happens for a reason. So there must have been a reason, and um, you know, I believe to this day the reason was because I was supposed to push the foodie footballer to the next level, focus on the nutrition, helping people with the mindset. And I think that's that's one of my um, affirmations. You know, I like to write my goals down as well. When I retire from football, I wanted to make the world a healthier, happier place. And I think that is that is my goal. I, I want to sort of, this is probably one of the reasons it came out of football. I chose to retire and the game didn't retire me really so i just want to try and help people get to that next stage with the health and fitness and the mindset as well yeah i love that and i think uh, there's something in that for sure for every and there were obviously a lot of brutal realities during the the kind of covid period and lockdown and everything else that but there's a phrase i love that in in all those periods of chaos that's where the magic lives and it's kind of the most exciting things can happen from the biggest of adversities. And, and that's exactly what you've done. So you mentioned the foodie footballer, you're going in a, in your own new direction. Um, you speak brilliantly on this. I heard great feedback from the event organizers that we both spoke with as well. Um, so yeah, tell us all about that. Tell us all about firstly, how that come about. Was that always something that was in the back of your man, uh, mind? Cause you seem like a man with a plan and, <laughs> and what's, what's the bigger picture for this? Where do you want to go with this? I, to be honest, it would, there was no plan intended, but okay. come on, Mark. So, like, man so, with a plan. You must have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, at 26 years old, when we got promoted to the championship, I decided to try and gain that edge and and get another string to my bow, basically. So I did a diploma in nutrition. It was an 18 module diploma. Um, it was all based around performance, recovery, and overall health and well being as well. Just you know, fueling properly. And it took my game to the next level. I went from running 11K in games to 13 and sometimes close to 14. So it made such a huge difference. I was feeling better. My mood was better. Um, wasn't getting brain fog. Was going into games with much more energy. And the most important thing for me as well, I was more present with my family. And, I, you know, off the field, I just felt uh, like I was recovering better. So I began to 
develop a real passion for nutrition and what what I was putting in my body because I knew it affected me mentally and physically. At the age of 33, um, when I was at QPR, I decided to set my my page up, my Instagram page, The Foodie Footballer, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to sort of encourage people to eat healthier, um, give them tools and, and different tips to fuel for performance, fuel for recovery, foods that fight inflammation, foods that improve your mental health. And I just was posting and trying to add value in people's lives anyway. Um, I got to a point where I was like, I want to take this further. So I did more qualifications, ended up doing my um, becoming a qualified gym instructor, personal trainer. And I did another um, course for athletic performance and weight management. So it's specialized in, in, in athletic performance, which I learned an awful lot. It wasn't just nutrition. It was anatomy of the body. And, and then this passion was becoming a bit of an obsession, really. Um, and then I sort of like, I need to get a website. I need to get a mailing list. And, and, and it was completely different for, for, for uh, from just going out, kicking a bag of air around. Um, and I was like, I'd love to go into businesses and try and, you know, encourage businesses and, and the employees to eat healthier because it will in turn help them become more productive. So then I went to a Countex and, you know, I was just, I was just trying to make as many connections as I could and, and change as many people's lives as I could as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got another event coming up in, um, in Hereford. Um, it's a conference, which um, I'm looking forward to. So yeah, I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to evolve it. And like my goals, you know, the, the foodie footballer can be, anything it wants to be and i want to push it to that next level do you know what i mean so yeah, yeah absolutely i'm excited to kind of see the progress of this it's cool like i said genuinely it's uh, had such a great buzz around uh your content in london uh earlier in the year um well i guess what interestingly from the public speaking coaching side of things that when i've worked with um professional sports people before they have been media trained, which is a whole different kettle of fish to standing up on stage as you did in front of hundreds of people <laughs> and talking about your own stuff. Um, is public speaking come naturally to you or is it something, again, you've had to really kind of push past or to to get coaching on? or, or how? Tell us about your first time that you stood up in front of people and spoke. Absolute fish out of water. <laughs> I'll tell you honestly, um, I, at 25 years old, I would be a nervous wreck, to be honest. And I feel like, you know, God's put this in me to sort of do it and make a lot, a big difference in the world. Um, And I'm still trying to learn and grow and develop because sometimes I go around in circles. You know, I'm really passionate about what I speak about and I feel like I repeat myself loads of times. So it's... um, it was something that I was really nervous about at Countex. And I think I did my first talk with SITS, which didn't go as smoothly, but then Accountex was a lot better. And I think with experience with, you know, just putting yourself out there as well. Um, you know, you, if you've got a passion, if you've got an obsession, then just give it a go. What's the worst could, that could happen? That That's the way I approached it, really. So, yeah, in all honesty to you, to your conversation media training if you get if i get asked a question i'm absolutely fine but if i'm to talk about something for 40 50 minutes it's all new to me i'm trying to learn develop and grow in, in that aspect absolutely i've built a career on winging it so you're fine it's no problem. <laughs> you're going to be good i love the fact that faith plays such a big part in in who you are and, and what drives you i think especially right now i think we, we seem to, that we're pushing, wishing to appear too negative, but it's certainly true. We seem to be living in a very passive aggressive society at the moment. And I think given the backdrop of the past few years, um, a lot of people have kind of stopped that, that mindset of growth or aspiration. And as we know, it's when people lose hope or the hope of something better. That's when the world can get quite a dark and dangerous place for a lot of people. How important is faith to you and, and faith generally to having a, a purpose kind of fueled uh ambition yeah faith's everything um because when you have your down days everyone has them it's it's how you bounce back and it's how you make that mindset mindset um shift as soon as possible because if you have 
if something happens, whether it be, you know, someone scratch your car or, um, you know, you, you drop a glass, whatever it may be, something so, so small, something big, mm. if you can flip that switch and just turn it into a positive as quickly as possible, look, easier said than done when something something's gone wrong. But always put perspective on things. You know, there's someone always worse off than you and perspective is a big thing. And if I'm having a day where I don't feel I've been productive or something hasn't got gone quite right, then I'll, I'll either pray, I'll, you know, I'll visualize an instance where it was going good, something was going well. Mm. Um, you know, even visualize a goal that I scored in the past and, and just get them good feelings back in your body. Um, yeah, big believer in it. And it really does make a difference. And for, for me, if I, if I feel like I'm, I'm struggling with something, you know, praying or meditating, visualization, yoga, these strategies really do help, even if it's eating well. You know, we all know if you eat a horrible processed meal, you feel like you just want to sleep half an hour, 40 minutes later. So, to, like going back to the small percentages, if we tick as many boxes as we can, whether it, it works for you, whether it's praying, whether it's, um, you know, having a 30 minute nap, going out for a walk, reading a book, there's so many different tools that can get you in that better frame of mind. So, yeah, it's a big part of me for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And so all of Mark's um, links and connections and stuff will be uh, in the bio. So please do follow his channels and profiles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm sure I'd be delighted to have you follow him. Um, he posts uh, some amazing content around these things. I guess, Mark, if you were going to give him just a, a few call to action points for people to have that kind of inner dialogue, that inner kind of questioning about nutrition and its importance in their lives... What do you say to people, kind of the, the couple of things that people could focus on straight away? Yeah, so um, getting some fresh air is number one. You know, first thing in the morning, get outside for 15, 20 minutes because that natural sunlight is is really good for the body. And and get a routine as soon as possible. Um, go to bed, wake up at the same time. Um, make sure you're getting up, you're having some water. Um, starting your day in the right frame of mind is massive. And if you start your day badly, it goes one way. Do you know what I mean? So how you start your days is, is, is really powerful. Uh, cold water therapy, um, having a cold shower really does waking you up. So these are really simple tools that everyone can do. It, it really is. And uh, your first meal is everything. You know, some people like to fast. But if you start the day with your high protein, high healthy fat and avoiding your refined um, foods such as your, you know, your refined sugars, ultra processed foods, you will start to notice a big difference, not only in your your mental health but your physical health as well. Wonder, wonderful, thank you. And you're right, actually, that kind of that physical versus mental health thing is one and the same, isn't it? It's just health essentially. Um, before I do let you go, because uh, sadly I do have to let you go. Um, it's a shame I could talk to you for hours, but it'd be the longest episode ever. Um, if I were announcing you to the stage, so I'm now the MC of the O2 Arena in London, 20,000 people have paid their hard earned money to come and hear you do your thing. Visualize that. <laughs> you're sat back in the green room. I'm just about to announce you to your crowd. Your crowd goes wild and your walk on music kicks in. That song that motivates you, that lifts you, that gets you at peak state. Mark Pugh, what would your walk on music be and why? Oh, it's... Um, I was str I'm struggling for this one. Um, <laughs> I believe I can fly. Nice. Good I think, stuff. Yeah, I believe I can fly. Um, there's a few artists that sing it, to be fair. Um, there's, a, there's a few different um, few different artists, but I just think I believe I can fly. Can You know, you can take your business, your mindset, your health, wherever you want. And, if you know, it's, it's really relevant to, to what I want to do. You want to fly, you want to, you know, live your life the way you know your family god want, want to live it so yeah I'll, I'll choose that song you put beautiful me on the message. spot there but yeah i was struggling for one <laughs> beautiful message love that so that choice along with every other choice from season seven will be on a playlist available at the end of the se uh, season so stay tuned for that uh, so the very least you get from this season is a great playlist of walk-on music but i know you're going to get far more than that and especially today big round of applause mark pew <laughs> cheers buddy Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. We really appreciate your time uh, being with us. Uh, any parting wisdom before we let you go? 
No, like, like I say, just just stay healthy. Um, do everything you can to, to feel your best. And, you know, just reach out to me. I'm, I'm open to questions. A foodie footballer. I've got a website as well. Um, and, you know, I, ju- I just want to try and create a healthy, happy world. So, yeah, reach out to me if, if you need me help. What a beautiful mission that is. I'm sure it's not going to be the only time you appear on this on this show. So, for now, Mark Pugh, thank you very much again. Appreciate your time. For everybody else, please stay tuned. Hit like, subscribe, and all that jazz. You know I'm not a details guy. Whatever it takes to get you back here next Monday. In the meantime, take care. Be well. Stay happy. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.